So thank you all for coming. And uh, you know, they say you're supposed to start with a joke. So I thought a cartoon would be better than a joke. So I promise you, even though uh, this Dilbert really uh, is sort of interesting when you look at it from the perspective of there's the person that's coming to sell and market you the, the next new thing. So the good news is that I'm not here to market the next new thing. I'm here to talk to and market and help you to understand an old thing that's going to be a little new for us in terms of how we interpret it and how we use it. So uh, hopefully that'll keep us from being in the same position right here. So, and now, this is one of the things where I get challenged with. Let's see whether or not... Okay, I didn't test it. I can walk. Okay, so we're going to talk about three main points. Um, we're going to talk about lean. So it's not total quality management, it's not TQM or any of the other Six Sigma or the new buzzwords, but we are going to talk about lean and why lean for quality and why lean for quality in software engineering and testing. Then we're going to talk about, you know, once you understand why lean is a possibility for you, then how do you identify waste and to me more importantly, how do you add value? Uh, in addition to getting rid of that waste. And then in the end, problem solving and solution development for a trimmer, more efficient, hopefully more effective organization. So, um, when we talk about why lean for quality, um, I don't know how many of you know about, you know, Toyota and lean and the use of lean in manufacturing? Okay, quite a few hands here. And so you know that uh, it was a very successful endeavor in terms of manufacturing. But in the last four or five years, maybe a little bit uh, later than that, we have seen uh, lean moving into the service industry. And so there are actually some very good statistics right now about how lean is able to be applied, not just to manufacturing, car building, parts uh, development, but also those in the service industry. And what they're seeing is two big things. One, that if you apply lean, that there's a significant, uh, around 50 to 60 percent uh, increase in efficiency and effectiveness in organizations that have taken the lean approach to looking at their processes and getting rid of things that are processes or steps or activities that aren't that uh, helpful to the added value you're trying to do as a uh, customer delivering a service. And so uh, it is an applicable technique uh, even though it did come from manufacturing. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So to really help you to understand it and put it in perspective, this is some statistics from the World Quality Report 2015-2016. Uh, and in it, this was a report that talked about Gardner indicates that the expenditure in uh, IT is about um, $1 trillion a year worldwide. And of that $1 trillion, about 1% of it is allocated to IT and software testing, which puts it at a really big pocket in terms of money. And so what the graph is showing that the increase of the total allocation of IT expenditure across the world allocated to um, testing and quality assurance. So in 2012, we went from 18% to 23%, 26%, 35%, and then in 2016, that was a predicted number, and actually I saw the graph later on, and they actually realized that greater than 40% of that budget was allocated to IT and testing. And the very interesting thing for me was that even though we're spending a whole lot more money on testing and quality, um, we're not seeing a corresponding or a correlational increase in product quality. Now, I'll be the first person to say that testing is not responsible for quality. So the fact that they're spending more money on testing and quality assurance doesn't necessarily show a correlation because we're not the total group responsible what, for quality, but we are a big component of that you know, search for quality. So it's an interesting question. So what they posed in the question was, you know, well, what's causing that lack of some significant kind of tie-in or relationship between more money spent here and product quality still not really advancing significantly from where it was before? And so truly we're going to, any software developers in the audience? 
not many, a few. We're, we're not going to blame you guys totally because there's the customer and their fuzzy requirements, there's developers, there's designers, there's testers. You know, we're all in this quality boat together. But what we're talking about today is that across the life cycle, there are places where we can become more efficient and more effective. And clearly, I know in software testing, uh, a number of us have experienced organizations where the kinds of things that they do just don't make sense and they don't help you to produce quality. And we talk about it and we complain about it, but this is an opportunity to look and see, is it possible for us to do something about it? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And Phil made me promise to tell you that because this is a long talk, I don't think 90 minutes is very long though, but because this is a long talk, halfway through, you'll have an opportunity to have a break in which case you can escape if you really find me an unpleasant speaker and this is not an engripping topic for you. Uh, and it will let other people come in if they are someplace else that they don't find as satisfying. So halfway through, we will have a break. Uh, but let's talk now about lean. So when you think about the lean uh, concept, basically everybody hears that we're trying to get rid of waste and we are trying to get rid of waste and we're also trying to look at how can we increase our value. But the key thing we want to take away, and I find this very interesting in where I work, and I'm sure in a number of places where you guys work, is that uh, we have some very complicated processes. And you look and you go, why are we really doing it that way? And oftentimes we're doing things that way because two years ago or three years ago or five years ago, or even 10 years ago, there was some situation that you created a process in response to that situation and you continue to do it because why? That's how you do things here. And until we stop and look and say, well, why do we have that approval? You know, what are we trying to achieve? We really don't get an opportunity to see if we really need to do it that way or not. And some things we do, there's a good reason for doing it and we should continue to do it. But I would guess for most of us, and I'll give you the statistic later, there are things that we're doing that just add no value whatsoever. And I'm gonna keep doing that because I try it this way, okay. Um, so what we'll be talking about then is we're gonna be applying Einstein's concept here in terms of lean. We're gonna look at what can we do to make things as simple as possible because we have found there's data there that shows that uh, simple, you know, the less complexity there is in software, what, the fewer bugs there are, and the less complexity in your process the fewer inefficiencies and the fewer defects or problems uh, there are. So that's what we'll be talking about today. So uh, let's talk about what are the principles of lean. And uh, what we have here are, one, the number one thing that everybody talks about is that we want to reduce waste. So you want to look at your process and see, are there any unnecessary steps or activities? Um, you want to amplify learning. And by amplify learning, they're talking about this is a very team-based kind of approach. It assumes that everybody is empowered, that the individuals in the team know what they're supposed to do, that what the responsibility is, and they're committed to getting it done. And they have been empowered to do it, so they don't have to run off and get a signature every few minutes uh, to make sure that that approval process is in place. So they have been empowered to execute. And when you empower people, you also ensure that they're trained and that they're learned and they know exactly what it is that they need to do. Uh, and you build integrity or quality in. You know, I'm very frustrated when I see processes where we stick QA or QC at the end and say, you know, we really want to have really good quality, so let's have that inspector check it at the end. And then, you know, we all know that you build quality in rather than test it in or inspect it in in the end. So the expectation is that if you're applying a lean concept, you're not just trying to look at reducing waste, you're evaluating how effective is my process in terms of being able to build quality in. You know, am I using processes that will support that capability? And one of the things we really found in Lean is that when they talk about decide as late as possible, we understand what we're trying to do is to get product out the door in software. And we know that the reason Agile is such an attractive philosophy and development methodology for us is that uh, those processes where we spent five months or six months or seven months figuring out the requirements and then another six months to design and another six months to code allowed for all kinds of changes to come in and all of a sudden now you're out of date. And so that concept is here also that you want to make critical decisions as late in the process as possible so that what? You have all, as much information as you possibly can have uh, in order to affect that decision in a timely manner. And that will allow you to do support what? 
deliver as fast as possible. So you want to have, again, my last principal concept over here is see the whole. It's very difficult for you to what? Deliver as fast as possible and especially decide as late as possible if you have no idea what the whole is supposed to look like. And so there's not a single principle here that can be taken out, but the composite of them, you know, reducing waste, empowering the team, looking at the whole, figuring out and making key decisions as late as possible and delivering as soon as you can, the applicability of all of those principles together give you the opportunity to have reduction in terms of efficiency, uh, increased effectiveness in your processes, and hopefully better service and added value to your customer. So, again, my last point, and I think I'm supposed to talk about the talk after the talk, so one of the things I really want you to walk away and remember is that lean is about reducing waste, but it's also about adding value. And adding value gets to be an interesting concept, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about testing, because we have a lot of customers that we're satisfying, so making sure we understand what we mean by added value in the context of which set of our customers that we're actually trying to satisfy. So let's go on. So now, how do we actually then reduce waste and add value? Um, what we want to do then is talk now about some techniques that actually let you do that. And there are a number of techniques, and I won't um, tell you a, a, a a marketing spiel that's not true in the sense that you'll walk out of this door and, and you'll be a lean expert and you'll be able to apply everything, but you will be able to walk out if you stay all the 90 minutes uh, with some tools and techniques for how to assess your organization uh, and look for areas that are inefficient and wasteful and don't add value. And then once you identify them, what you can actually do about them in terms of coming up with proposed solutions and how to find the best solution. So that is the promise that I do make for you at the end of the session. So now let's talk about how do you actually trim an organization. So the key thing we need to talk about before we begin to start looking at how do you get rid of waste and how do you make sure that you're efficient and effective is to understand how important processes are in the whole activity of what we're doing. So we're going to come up with our basic definition of a process is what those series or activities or steps that uh, allow you, when you do them in order, allow you to get what? Something done. So if you want to cook a meal, you buy groceries, you know, maybe you find the recipe first and find out what your ingredients are, go to the grocery store, come in, open everything up, put it together, cook it in the oven or bake it on the stove, one or the other, and voila, you've got dinner. So what we're trying to say now is that statistics tell us that most organizations, the processes that they have, there is at least a significant number of the steps in the process that add no value. The number actually is somewhere around about 55, 60%. That 65 or 50% of the activities in a number of the processes that we all are doing add no value in terms of the actual end results. And when they talk about adding value, they're saying that the fact that you want to get good product out of the door, that activity doesn't help the product get out of the door faster or quicker or better. Oftentimes, there are things that you have to do because you have to do them. But we don't really even understand at this point sometimes why we have to do it. One of the other key information to understand is that 85% of the management problems that most of us deal with or the work-related problems that we deal with on our job are typically attributed to what? Bad processes. So, you know, when we go in and we're having a frustrating, typical day where you can't really get things done, for most of us, at least 85% of that frustration and pain and agony is because we've got some inefficient processes that are in place within our organization and they are causing you to be unable to get work done in the most efficient and the most effective way possible. So what, do we, what can we do about that? And so that's where we start thinking about um, applying lean thinking, moving it from manufacturing into software engineering. So um, I think you should be able to see this fairly well from the back. What we have here is on the far right hand side is the lean principles from the manufacturing definition. And so what I'm going to walk through in this table is on this side we have lean 
And then in the middle we have Poppendex translation of those manufacturing lean concepts uh, in terms of software development or software engineering. And then all the way over we have Mallison's interpretation of those concepts from a testing perspective. So let's walk through because this is an important table because understanding how we can apply the manufacturing terminology and from lean in terms of software and as well as testing is the key to being able to employ some of these techniques when you move forward. So when we talk about one of the lean concepts is that inventory so that when you're in an organization and you have an inventory or a stock room that's filled up and it's waiting for what? to be used, that it is what? Waste or money that is not what being used efficiently. So you want the concept of what? Just in time inventory. And that's why, you know, think about the software, think about the um, grocery stores now. Before, some years ago, uh, one of their greatest costs was all of the inventory that needed to be restocked. And they had no real means of knowing what was sold that day, so they carried lots of stuff. Now, because they have electronic uh, uh, entry, then they know exactly what's short in each store. So now they can do what just in time supply to that store and it saves a lot of money. So that's what we're looking at here in terms of this concept for inventory. So when we think about it in software, uh, Poppendex says those are our requirements. Those are the inventory of things that need to be what developed uh, and designed and actually put in place to produce that product. So from the Mallison's perspective, then test cases then become our inventory. So if you're in an organization where, um, then my organization does this a lot, uh, they, they can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of manual, very in-depth, very formal test cases that uh, sit and they are created, but oftentimes they don't get run because you run out of time. So the question is, you know, when you're creating something in an inventory and it either doesn't get used or it, as it, it's not used as it's needed because you, and it's set for a long time, so that's effort that's been put in place to create it and it's not really going to be useful to you, you're creating potential waste. So does that make sense to you from the perspective of inventory requirements and, and test cases? Okay. So the next one is overproduction. This one is sort of interesting uh, from in the software perspective, but we're talking about here where you're producing something more than what the demand requires. And one of the interesting examples for us is our cell phones now. Most of our cell phones do a whole lot more things than we want them to do or need them to do right now. And whether or not that's an effective uh, process right now, we're not going to get into. But Extra features are considered potential areas of waste because you what? Spent time and effort and design into producing it and it's not being used. And I'm sure that there's some corollaries in the, in the cell phone market that it's still okay to have those features in in terms of the rapid pace of technology and maybe it pays out in the end. But that's the concept we're looking for here. So for our testing perspective, um, test over coverage. So when you're testing areas that you don't need to test, and oftentimes I see this in regression testing because we may not have a correct process for identifying how much of the regression suite should we run. So maybe we do what? Run all of it. Or maybe we don't have you know, a really good process so we run almost everything as regression because we don't have a way to identify what's the necessary ones to do. So from the, the lean perspective, uh, that's waste. You know, maybe we should be spending time, if we can do that better, then we can spend time creating uh, or executing tests that really do what? Break the software and actually give us some information about whether that product is ready for quality or not. So then let's talk about extra processing. So extra steps in the process that aren't really need. So extra steps uh, over precision, from the testing perspective, redundancy and weak tests. You know, one of my favorite things to say is that when I began a tester some years ago, um, I got really, really good at writing tests that said, met the requirements. So if the requirements said the screen was blue, then I was really good at writing those tests that showed that the screen was actually blue. But it took me, I would say, about three, four years before I began to write tests that actually broke the software. And so um, I'm a big test strategy person right now versus a test plan person because I really feel that 
a lot of times we spend a lot of time writing tests or testing things that essentially are pass, 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 pass. And we haven't really added value to that testing process because um, there are tests out there that would have actually exercised the code or actually got to some of those production kind of interesting complex bugs that show up. But we didn't get to them because we spent a lot of time testing or executing tests that essentially were, we sort of knew that they should pass because they're basic requirement kind of tests. So we're going to have to balance what's a good mix for us in terms of our particular environments. But clearly, uh, tests that aren't really, if you're really trying to find out whether or not the software is ready for production, and you're really trying to find bugs before the customer gets it, then what percentage of the tests that you do should be tests that just say, well, we need to check if it's blue and see if it's blue, or how much of the test should be tests that really exercise the complexity of the code and really try to break it. And that's going to be a decision that you make on an on a application or type basis, but that needs to factor in that decision. And again, that's an area of waste. So having a lot of tests that don't really help you to find a bug uh, in the software is potentially waste. So how much of that should we do in our regular testing strategy and cycle? Then we look at transportation. So on the manufacturing side, we're talking about the shipping of goods from one place to another. Now we know you have to ship things, um, but uh, how efficient that shipping is and the, and the shortest possible time is what you want to do in manufacturing. But for us, so in software, it's clearly handoffs. And this is an area for us in testing that gets really interesting because we do have a lot of waste in the handoffs. There's a lot of waiting time oftentimes in handoffs. And some of the handoffs absolutely have no sense whatsoever to us in terms of our ability to actually add value and get the, the, the testing done. So again, so we're looking at, again, the handoffs, foggy directions where you have to go back and get them clarified. So a handoff is given and then you say, you know, I, that doesn't make sense. Go call them back up and see whether or not you know, we really understand what they're trying to get done. So again, we're looking at that. So anything that has you all over the place and a lack of clarity in getting things executed is considered in our translation of transportation. Uh, then we've got waiting. So the lag time between steps. So you go from step A to step B to step C. Uh, I've got a, an interesting story on my, my company does a public release process. And so I submitted this on July 5th and um, it kind of set and I would send a couple of emails and say, you know, nobody's really looked at it. You know, it's supposed to be in the automated workflow systems. And then lo and behold, uh, two weeks before the conference, after the date that the uh, cycle had the publication actually supposed to have been submitted uh, was when we started getting into the process of actually reviewing. So the, the, the lag time between my submission and when somebody actually took a look at it was unsupportable uh, in, in this particular time. So any time you're waiting, and that includes waiting for uh, customers or waiting for handouts from other groups, all of those are opportunities where there is waste that could be occurring. So then we've got motion. So within a process, lots of motion and moving uh, around. Uh, Poppendeck interprets that as, in our environment, when you have to go find information. Uh, so again, if it's not readily available and it's not where you need it when you need it, then all of that is, again, unnecessary uh, motion. Also for us from testing, Maslin says that unnecessary tests are where we have to do what? Repeat because you know you run your smoke test or you don't have a smoke test and you execute and you can't really test because what it crashes immediately so you then you send it back and then it comes back so that repeating over and over again is potentially areas for waste and yes we're in an environment where the expectation that you're going to have bugs you're going to have problems and that some of that should be built in what we have to look at when you begin to look at your processes to see uh, which ones are uh, necessary a part of the process and which ones are way over that and we're into a part where now this is ridiculous and we're really not going to be able to be efficient and effective in this. Okay? And the last one are just plain old bugs. Any defect in the manufacturing process that puts that component or that part uh, where it's not within its specifications or scope is a defect. And the same thing for us. So any defect that's not caught in, in the life cycle or as close to where the defect actually occurred 
uh, is considered waste because you've got people that have put in effort and time throughout the process. Any questions at all about the lean techniques and the interpretation? Yes. I'm a little bit lost on the motion mm -hmm. information, the unnecessary ties. Mm -hmm. Basically, because this one is, is talking about any kind of movement within a process. So uh, if you, for instance, if you're in the requirement gathering part and the testers need requirements and you have to, there's a requirement document, but you can't find it. You know, you have to go someplace else to look for it. So that's what they're talking about in terms of finding information where it's not really available when you need it. Uh, Malison's, this one is an interesting one. And I, I have to admit, I'm not... I'm not totally sold on, on it because I think a necessary test uh, fit better in overproduction and some of the other areas than as motion. Yeah. But that is, that is, that's, that's his definition and so I put it on there. But I'm glad you took a look at it because I don't really like that one. But I do feel that repeated cycles is one where we have to repeat and redo things over and over again that is a necessary motion within that individual process. Good question. I thought I saw another hand. No? Okay. All right. So how do we apply this then? So if we use those techniques to help us to find waste, so let's talk a little bit about value. And this one I really like because I think uh, this is an area where because we have multiple <laughs> customers, you know, when I think about software testing, and I'm going to come over here to the board for a minute, but when I think about it, if you all could just shout out, who are some of the people that you have to satisfy, even if you're on like an Agile team? Um, and if you have a testing role. So who is it that is looking for information or data from the testing group or the testing or the quality person? Marketing. Marketing? What was that last one? Product owner? Sponsor. Sponsor, yes. Your manager. Manager. Yep. There's Dev. There's often a project manager. Customers. There's a customer. Other teams. Yeah, other teams. So when we start talking about our ability to add value, we have a lot of people that we have to satisfy. And oftentimes, uh, at a high level, we could say, well, they all really want the same thing, but they don't really want the same thing when you really look at what they're looking for. And they may want the same thing, but they want it in a different way. For instance, the project manager, you know, is looking for whether or not you're going to do what? Meet your schedule, stay on budget, and things like that. And yeah, they want, the, they want the testing to be done and they would like product quality, but their job is really to make sure that what the project stays according to schedule. So that focus in terms of what they really want from you is going to be different than the product owner is going to be looking for probably more information about is the product really ready for prime time and how good is it and are we really moving forward to that quality target and that's different information than the marketing people are looking for something else the end customer and so part of what we have to do in looking at our value as a service organization is to see if we can get a clear idea of what are the key things that each organization or group wants from you and whether or not um, you're able to provide that because that's where you have reduced the way so you've gone and looked at your processes and uh, you're as efficient as you can be but does that mean that you're still adding or providing the value that your end customer really wants maybe maybe not you know yes you're efficient and effective so maybe this person is really happy but maybe that efficiency and effectiveness doesn't really apply as much to what this person is looking for so we need to have a combination of we've got as efficient and as effective as we can be in terms of our activities and our processes but then we have to look at the process and say then when I do it this way does it really provide the value that this person wants and this person wants and this person wants and that begins to be a very challenging aspect sometime for us when we have those multiple people to look at so how do you actually look at value? And how do you actually look at your processes in terms of the efficiency of them and the effectiveness of them and whether or not they're really wasting time or wasting steps within it? The key thing is to do a value stream map. And this is one of the classic tools that you see in Lean. Um, 
What I like about it is because for most of us, it's not that different from the same old flowchart that we're used to. So it's not a whole new, totally something that's out of the world that's different. So if you look here, uh, we've got a very high level value stream map. And I don't show here all of the different kinds of parameters that you can look at, but this is a basic one that most of you would be able to do something like this and you would be able to use it to come up with, uh, again, looking for wasteful steps in your activities uh, to point you out in the way. So here, uh, we're looking at this particular uh, value stream map is uh, looking at stapling something. So the person picks up the stapler and so underneath that box is time, so it takes one second to do that, and distance, so we're looking at what? Motion. So this is a value stream map that's looking at cycle time, how long things take, as well as distance. There are lots of other parameters that you can look at, but typically for us, these are the, some of the primary ones. And so then we look over here, they walk to where the stapler is, and so it takes five seconds to walk to where the stapler is, and it's again, it's a distance of 20 feet. Then we look at, they actually take the staple, and that's about two seconds, and there's no distance because you've got the staple in your hand and you've got the paper in your hand. And then you walk back to your desk, another five seconds, a distance again of 20 feet, then you put the paper down, one second, distance of zero. So we've got a very simple value stream map right here. And looking at it right now, can you identify what you would consider to be the step that doesn't add value? Or are there steps that don't add value? The walking does. Because the walking doesn't help you what? Staple? Doesn't get you a staple product in the end. So what we have here then is the capability for you to you to, do the total time for the value stream map. And then you look at the total distance if that is something that's a factor in your particular process. And so right now, we're looking at, in terms of value add, the things that you do that add value, can you identify them? Pick up the paper, that's the one second. Staple, so that's plus two is three seconds. And those are, those are the only steps in the process that do what? Add value that actually create and help you or support you to actually getting the activity done. Anything else is considered non-value add. And that doesn't mean that all non-value add activities should be thrown out. But you need to look and ask, since this doesn't add value to the process, should I do it or not? And some things you're going to still say, well, we probably still should do that. But some things you're going to say, no, there's really no need to do that particular step. And that's what the whole thing about the value stream map is. So if you, if you go on the internet and search for value stream map, you're going to see all kinds of, you, they're all going to be flowchart based. Some of them have some very complicated uh, data that gets collected, tack time. But for us, for the most part, something like this would probably be an effective way for you to, at a high level, look at the key steps that you have. What are the key activities that you do in test planning, in test recording your bugs? And what we found is that almost, if you take a group of people in your organization and say, okay, everybody write down the steps that we do for recording defects. If you have five people, the odds are you're gonna have five different steps. They may have all the same activities in it, but they're gonna be in different order. And probably somewhere in that group is somebody that's doing it the what? Most efficient and effective way. And the rest of the people are doing it in less efficient or less effective ways. And so that's the whole idea about the process and the value stream map is that it helps the team uh, come up with hopefully the best, most efficient, less wasted step, less wasted motion possible. So that again, you've got a really lean, effective process that's gonna allow you to do what? Reduce the waste and be able to hopefully add more value, okay? So, one, t one technique. The other technique to do is to look at your organization. At, oh, is that a question? Yes? Just, uh, okay, I can mm -hmm. understand time, mm -hmm. but I don't understand distance. Okay. Is distance latency? Uh, in this case, it's motion. But it could be latency for how we do testing, because we don't have a lot of real motion. But in this particular case, they were measuring distance. Let me go back for a minute, just so you can see. That's what I meant by that you're gonna see some variations in your value stream maps. And so you get to decide, uh, you, almost all of them, you are actually calculating the 
the actual time that the process activity takes. That's a given in all the value stream maps. The other parameters that you measure and look at vary. Manufacturing looks at a certain set. You know, software engineering looks at a different set. And so in this particular case, for this example, because they really wanted to make it obvious that the walking around was the part that really was not value add. They wanted to like put it in your face. For us, it would not probably be distance. You would do wait time. And so you would have, how long does it take here? And then on the arrow between this step and the next step, then you could put, you know, 10 days waiting or five days waiting, or two weeks for approval. And that lets you know the, the waiting time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Gotcha. All right, anyone else? OK. So another technique uh, that I like to use is strengths, weakness, threats, and opportunities, the SWOT. Uh, and this is used more across the organization or the team. So for instance, if you've been asked to be more efficient and more effective in terms of your test organization or your test team, or you're being asked to justify whether or not you are effective, or they're looking at outsourcing or insourcing, all those options, this is a good way, uh, technique to use. And what you do is, you take a look at your organization, and I like to brainstorm. You stand up, have somebody facilitate, and you say, well, what are the things that we really do well? So people throw it out, you jot them all down, and just like when you're doing JAD sessions for requirements, no answer that somebody throws out is wrong. You allow people to just throw out because you're going to analyze them and prioritize them later on. So you list all of the things that you feel that you're doing well, and then you look at all of the things that, that are weaknesses that are not affected. Like maybe that you don't have a change control process, and so things that come in, you never really know whether or not you've got the right build or not. Or you don't have a good requirements management process, or you have to go and wait for days. So all of the things that are hampering your ability to be effective uh, as a test team or as a test organization. Uh, then you look at the things that are actually threatening your capability to get things done. And then last but not least, then you look at are there any opportunities that uh, would be, you would be able to actually enhance, that would actually help you to enhance what you're doing, or there are opportunities that occur, but you can't take advantage of them because you're really not in a position to do so. And what you do is that you look at all of them, and what I found when I do this is that oftentimes there are things that you haven't really noticed that when you put up, you go, you know, I forgot that, you know, this is something we are doing really well. And, you know, I've forgotten how bad or what the negative impact so and so is on. Um, what we're trying to get done. So it has, it has a really good technique to allow you to really assess your organization and look and see, I'm looking for opportunities to be what? More efficient, more effective, and to add value. And so you can look through this and a lot of your weaknesses are gonna be things that potentially are waste areas. And a lot of the opportunities may be other things that you could do to do what? Add value. And the same thing with threats could also potentially be waste areas. So. Uh, the best, uh, let me back up just a minute. I just worked with an organization on one of these, and what I really found is that we had uh, a development group that did it, and then we had a testing organization that did the SWOT analysis, and then we had a separate one that was performed by the project leader group. And it was really amazing to see, we did a correlation between the three groups in terms of their strengths to see how many common strengths each of the groups felt that uh, were resident in the organization, uh, how many common threats, and had them prioritize. And so what we were able to do then is to come up with improvement ideas that cross what? All three of the groups. And so the SWOT analysis is a very effective tool to help you, to help you do that. Okay. So, what I'd like to do now is, um, I forgot to tell you in the beginning of this, that I really like a, an interactive class, and even though this is not quite a class, um, I put in an interactive session. So this gives us a chance to kind of look at what we talked about before, and to see whether or not it's um, coming in in a point that you can go back to your organization and actually apply it. So what I've got here is that, so we've got, over here, the key steps in terms of writing a bug ticket. So you review the defect, you analyze your trends, you create a report, and you publish a, a defect report. This is actually higher level than just a ticket. So we've got the waste areas. So let's talk about when you think about 
test uh, defect reporting. In your organization or in testing in general, are there any activities that we would consider to be overproduction? Mm hmm. Writing up the same defect once for every single place. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Or forgetting it, refining it. Okay, mm hmm. So writing the same defect ticket. <clears throat> Refinding it after you thought it was fixed. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Writing up a defect at all when you could just tell it over next year. Okay. Writing it up. Writing it up. Period. <laughs> Actually, I did work on a project where we didn't write them until after after we discussed it with the developer. You wrote them up then. Anybody else? Writing one that no one's gonna fix. Okay. Ah, a good one. That no one fixes. All right, over here. So we were, we were creating trend reports and metrics mm -hmm. that were out of context for the target group that they were reading. Yes, so yes. I love that one. <laughs> and I think I see Phil saying it's time for you all to escape if I'm a boring speaker <laughs> or have a drink and come back. How long is the break? 15 minutes, okay? Hopefully I'll see most of you back again. Okay, we're not gonna do all of these, but I'm gonna do one other sample here so that you get a chance to um, see how, again, the process works. So this is what I recommend that you do if you're taking, you wanna take a look at your high-level processes, look at your project, you know, your test planning, test design, you know, walk through and look at each of the waste areas and says, you know, do we have any overproduction here? You know, how about rejects and defects? How about waiting? And then by the time you're done, then you've got a pretty good idea about waste areas or areas where you could be more efficient. So uh, I do this in combination with the um, value stream map, but it's a really good quick way to start thinking about, you know, what kinds of things are doing well and what things are not doing so well in terms of our organization. So let's look at um, how about inefficient processing in, in terms of testing and writing your defect reports. So inefficient processing. Is that a? Just writing up above is inefficient in many ways. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some people that would argue that that's not true, but uh, yeah. <laughs> But I agree with you. I guess what I mean is if I'm sitting right next to the developer mm -hmm. and he says, oh, just write that up for me. I'll get to it. Mm -hmm. hey, what's the point of that? You're sitting right here. I'll just right. talk about it. Just fix it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. I, I agree. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Testing on all the smart platforms so that you can include your initial report. Everything's in there. Okay. Ah. Yeah. 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 That's a really it's a big inefficiency area for testing in in general. The whole defect. I mean the whole mm -hmm. environment management. Yes. DevOps don't start automating. Say that again. DevOps. DevOps doesn't start automating. Ah. Oh, you're right. Okay, I'm gonna stop right here, but I think you got the idea about how to look at the, take the techniques, think about your processes and what you're doing and, and, and identify those inefficiencies. Then after that, if you do your value stream maps and plot out the waiting time or cycle time, how long things take, and especially the, the waiting where you have or the handoff times, that's a really good way for you to identify areas where, um, some things might be taking longer than they, they need to. And if you're particular, if you're looking for um, trying to get better relationships with other teams, the, what you're getting, the input into your process isn't as efficient as it is. This is the kind of data that allows you to go to management to say, well, you know, if we could streamline this 
in terms of handout, then I could do this in terms of efficiency, in terms of my group. So this begins to build that data and information that often is the argument or the justification you need to get other groups to change how they're doing things so that things are better in terms of how testing runs or executes. Okay, so we talked about value stream mapping, we talked about using SWOT analysis, we talked about walking through your process and looking at the, the lean uh, principal areas where potential waste are, and when you're done with that, you've got some potential process problems. So you've identified maybe some waste areas, maybe you identified some things that are working well, you've identified looking at processes, specific things that are going wrong, so how do you then get to what's, what's the solution? And so what we want to do now is to talk a little bit about you've got a potential waste area, you've got a problematic process, so what do you do about it? So we're going to talk about problem solving and solution development, again, looking at that tremor organization. So what do you do when you find waste? The big thing you want to do is come up with a problem solving technique, and this is the basic one that I like to use. Uh, how many of you have heard of PDCA or Plan, Do, Check, Act? So this is basically PDCA. So if you look at, uh, if you've got a problem, the first thing they ask you to do is define the problem so that everybody understands what it is, use the basic common language, nothing that, uh, if you look at it, most people read it and go, oh, I got, I got that, what that problem is. So that's what we're looking for here, a very basic definition. It doesn't have to be the, you know, the world-renowned uh, essay. So then you want to look at it. We have this problem, then what are some potential solutions to the problem? So this is where brainstorming comes in, and it's very effective. So you do some brainstorming activities. And again, let people throw out all kinds of ideas, because sometimes some of the most far-fetched things, when you really try to see if it can work, come up with some very creative solutions. So let people throw out all kinds of ideas. And then you begin to do what? Evaluate all of those ideas in terms of resources and time and effort and feasibility. Uh, and then you, you've got what? some selective possibilities. And I like to prioritize them because one of the things we found is sometimes one idea, when you really start working it out, it really isn't that great, although it looked great on paper. So then you go to what? Option number two, or back up option number three. And so then finally, so you've got your possible candidates, and so then you implement them. And I like the follow-up part because, again, you want to check to see whether or not what you did, what makes a difference. And that's how you do with the follow-up. So this is an iterative process. It goes over and over and over again. You define the problem, come up with alternative solutions, evaluate and pick one, then you implement and see whether or not it really what works. Does it make a difference? And if it does, then you implement it, and then you're continuously evaluating and looking at other problems that come up, and that's how you stay in that wor world where you're continuously making yourself what, a little bit better. And that's why this whole lean process works so well with Agile, because again, that's what they're trying to do in Agile. You're trying to always what? You know, work through the process, and, and you have those um, lessons learned afterwards to do what? To see what you can do better the next time, and so it is a continuous kind of improvement methodology or approach. Okay, another thing that you can do for problem solving is to use the cause effect diagram. And so basically the way that this one is done is that you have your problem, and so you define the problem over here. And so if I were in a brainstorming session, then I would list out what the problem is. So we could say, we've got too many defects that uh, are duplicated in our database. So that's the problem. And so then um, the classic approach for the um, cause-effect diagram is to group things into, is the issue related to people or material like resources uh, or the environment or the process? Or, or materials or management, okay? So, I actually got materials twice. But when you're done, you, let's say we've got too many defects uh, that are duplicated. So somebody might throw out and say, it's because our people aren't trained. So you write that down. And then somebody else might say, well, it's because uh, we wait too long between writing the tickets, and so nobody knows, or they don't check to see whether or not it's already written up. And so you put your causes in the right bucket, and then you go through and you do a discussion about it. And when you're done, you've got a problem and you've got what? Lots of potential causes to the problem. 
And so again, this is a problem solving technique. It's going to help you to get to what, what we like to call is the root cause. So, and what you do is then you then begin to talk about, you know, is it really training? Uh, and what is it about training and what could we do? And by the time you walk through the different uh, potential causes, and there's actually some specific exercises you can do to get to a root cause, but it will help you to then further analysis come out with, voila, we think that the major problem why we have so many duplicates is because nobody really checks the database before they write a ticket up. Maybe that's it. So that's what you're using this technique for is to help you to do what? find the actual cause because once you get the right cause then you can do what come up with a solution but oftentimes we end up if we don't do this kind of analysis we end up with a cause but you still have what recurring problem once you implement it because you didn't really find the right foundation kind of cause so it's really important that you drill down and ask about uh, is it really something related to the people or is it really related to our process uh, or is it really related to an environment or is it really related to something outside of our group that we can't really do anything about unless we go to management and have them help us out. But that's what the whole technique is designed to help you do is to solve the problem so that of your all alternative possibilities, this is the one that you think would be a good solution. The other technique we want to talk about in terms of problem solving is that what that value stream map does, particularly if you're doing the time between each one of the steps, uh, in particular with handoffs, is that you're trying to begin to start looking at your processes to start measuring them. And I'll be honest, sometimes this is a really tough thing for us to do in testing. You know, if we ask, you know, how long does it take you to write a test? How long does it take you to write? Uh, a complex test and so there are some industry uh, statistics or some averages that you can use to see whether or not you are above or below the, the, the baseline but generally you're going to have to do some surveys of your team uh, and or do some measures where they you know let's everybody we're going to go write a test you jot down when you start you jot down when you're in but you have to come up with some technique to see uh, how long are the process really taking us because you can't tell whether or not the process is effective or not, or if it's wasteful or not, if you have no idea how long it takes. You know, uh, like the, the thing with the, with the bug ticket. You know, if the bug ticket, you know, is um, recorded where you actually speak it out loud and it goes into a database, you know, if, if the timing is a pro if time to do it is a problem, then that could be a solution. But if the fact that you shouldn't be writing them at all or you shouldn't be recording them at all, then the fact that you haven't recorded, you haven't really addressed the problem. So you really want to have that measurement for how long is it really taking us to do it. So here's some things to think about when you're looking at trying to measure a process. So if you're going to look at the process for recording defects, you want the activity of the time it takes from the very, very beginning, and you'll have to synchronize what that is. You know, is it beginning the minute you think there's a bug? Or is it after you've done your rechecking to make sure that you really think it's a bug? So, you know, where is the starting point and where is the ending point? So that's got to sort of be defined uh, in a, a consensus. So how long does it take to complete the process? Uh, for some of you, you need to know how much it costs. Uh, particularly if you're looking at outsourcing or you're an outsource supplier, then uh, being able to talk to your customer about the average cost that you have in terms of defect tracking or the average cost for test planning activities or test environment management activities might be a significant factor in your ability to, to uh, win that contract. So cost comes in effect in some places uh, in particular. Uh, then you ask the question, once you've measured it, how long does it take? Then you start looking to see whether or not it's efficient or not. And remember, efficient means that you don't have any wasted steps or activities. That's what we're talking about in terms of efficiency. Effectiveness is, does the process really do what it's supposed to do? So if testing is designed to find bugs and 95% of the tests you execute don't find bugs, then the question comes back, are you writing effective tests? Uh, some people would say no, especially if once it goes into production, there are bugs that get found. Then it clearly would come back that, you know, there's an effective process problem here. Yes? So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I've designed test activities to reveal bugs, the question comes back with, would this really happen? Yeah, I know. Developers love that one. <laughs> <laughs> they do. 
And the, 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 the answer is, yeah, it could happen, yeah. Because we all know that almost all of the interesting production kind of bugs that get out, you look and you go, God, who would have thought to do that? You know, but that is still, so yes, you know, that the, the answer is that you are trying to see if in a complex situation, providing complex kinds of things, will, is the system reliable enough to execute it and stay up and not fail? And so that is what you're really trying to do. So that is, the, that is the right answer. You are doing it right. And I understand that people struggle with this because for so many years we've done, most of our testing has been what I consider requirement-based testing. So we have a list of requirements and all we're trying to do is prove that the requirements are there. And so we have lots of tests that do that and we're really good at writing those. But it's really hard to write the ones that make the, the, the system break. Uh, it's more challenging, it's more difficult. And what I try to do in my test strategies is I have a combination of that. I have some people that are working on the, okay, let's check to make sure everything's blue because we have to come back and tell the customer that we check that it's blue. Although I do have scenarios actually for not doing that as much either. But then I have a significant part of the strategy that's designed to do what you're talking about. Because then, because and I do it in terms of risk. And so the, the, these are risk and so I'm trying to ameliorate production failure risk, and this is the strategy that we have to execute to do that, okay? Anybody else in terms of question? Okay, so basically when you're talking about a process, there are attributes, and basically those attributes are how long does it take, you know, what's the effort that it, that's associated with it, so the number of person hours to accomplish, so these are some of the things that you want to think about when you're looking at a process and you want to evaluate and see whether or not it's efficient and whether or not it's effective. So is it achieving what we want to achieve and are we doing it in the fastest, quickest, least wasteful way possible is what we're looking for. Okay, so how about problem solving for this? So we have a case where, and I need to go get the brown because I'm pretty sure you guys can't see that light pink over here. Okay, so think about what's on the board here. So we have a problem where uh, it takes too long to execute the test. So if we were doing a problem solving kind of exercise, uh, do you want to do a um, fishbone or do you want to do, what technique would you like for figuring out or we can do analyze the problem, come up with ideas. Maybe that would be quicker for here. Okay, so here's our problem. It takes too long to execute tests. Okay, so we did our analysis, we did our value stream, and that's one of the things we looked at and said, boy, it's taken us a really long time to get tests executed. So one of the techniques we talked about for problem solving is to do what? Define the problem. So we've defined it. It's taking way too long to execute the test. So the next thing it says, come up with alternative ideas about addressing the problem. What could cause the problem? So what are some things that could cause us to have too long a time to execute tests? Mm -hmm. Okay, too many tests. Okay, all manual. Not enough testers. Oh, you guys are so fast. Okay. Systems don't match what the production systems are. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Say that one again. I know it was a good one. <laughs> systems don't match what. Ah, systems. right. Slow systems down. aren't available. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna stop after this one. <laughs> Have to wait for jobs to run. Yes. Sorry, gotta get to okay, so using our technique we talked about, then you would take these possible problems and we could plot them out on a fishbone or we could then take each one and say, okay, um, what's happening here with it's, you know, too many tests? So what can we do about the fact that we're writing too many tests? And so people are going to throw out ideas and you're going to go through each one of them and then in the end you're going to come up with what do you think are the one or two or three key activities that if you did a solution for those two or three key activities, you do what? Improve that process. So that's what you're looking for is, you know, you define the problem, 
you come up with some alternative solutions because all of these are definitely systematic kinds of issues that most testers face. Probably in your organizations, some of you, it's probably two or three of the main ones, but most of you probably don't have all of them, hopefully. But <laughs> we'll, see, we'll, we'll see. But but that's what we're looking for. So does that make sense in terms of being able to fine tune? All right, great. We're getting there. We're going to actually have a solution in the end. So. All right, so do you have a solution then that will trim the waste? So we've talked about techniques to identify the process problems. We've come up with some potential causes of why we're having some of the problems. And now we have to start thinking about what are the solutions that we put in place. And I'll be honest with you, um, this is one of the trickiest areas because um, most of you have been in organizations before that have changed their processes. You know, they announced the whole new, you know, my company's got a new one. It's the new so-and-so way. And so everybody goes, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because we've all rolled our eyes because we've been in those new things. And uh, the amount of process improvement problems that fail actually are higher than the problems we have with systems being implemented in projects that fail to meet cost and budget. Because it's a very difficult thing to do. And because, uh, in my opinion, we often don't get professionals to help us do it. We sort of think that we can you know, make it up and do it on our, on our own. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that, since I do want you to try to do it on your own, uh, to give you some techniques uh, to allow you to be more successful in doing that, OK? So this is a lean framework that actually sort of helps in terms of putting together the pieces for a solution and getting you to the point where you're ready to implement. So one, you know, look for pain points and waste. So we've done that. You know, we walk through looking at overproduction and all those activities. So we look for pain points. We've identified a few pain points. So then uh, we would need to develop a list of potential candidate solutions. So we're going to do that in a few minutes. We're going to go take the list of, you know, it takes too long to execute tasks. And we're going to throw out some solutions to all of those problems that we have there to see uh, what are some solutions that could be put in place for that. And then, again, you're going to appraise and assess the solutions. Because some of the solutions are feasible to implement. And others might need, what, an organizational change or a VP or lots of money. Uh, and so, so some solutions are better than others in terms of being able to implement. And then you're going to, what, devise and come up with that future state solution. And then that's when the interesting part comes in, because now you've got um, a new way to do things, and you have to do what? Roll it out, or tell people about it, or convince them to use it, and et cetera. And that's oftentimes where projects fail. Uh, typically, uh, they call it the delta. Uh, and so getting from, oh, I got a new solution and I got a new thing to everybody trained and implemented and it's working is where most uh, process improvement projects fail because that's a really hard thing to do, convincing people to, to often change. You know, we'll change when we want to change. You know, we like that new iPhone 8 but because, you know, it's cool and whatever, but we don't want to change in some other areas. Okay, so does that make sense to you in terms of how to use the framework? So, um, okay, so what I like to do is that I'm a big believer in data-driven decisions. And so if I were over here with our solutions, then I would start asking whether or not we have some data about some of this. So when, when we say, well, we got too many tests, and I go, what do you mean by we've got too many tests? So I'm hoping that somebody's going to say, well, uh, on average, you know, we execute 500 tests and they always pass. You know, so we're going to be looking for data like that because otherwise we're not really sure that we're going to do what? Have a solution that's going to work if you don't really understand, again, the cause. So you want some data. So data helps you to understand if it really is a problem and the data should also help you in the end see whether or not the solution that you are trying is actually going to be successful for you or not. So uh, you're going to look at, again, complaints and issues. Uh, so that's a good way to come up with potential uh, improvement ideas if you look at the kinds of things either your customer is complaining about or that the project manager is, customer is uh, complaining about or maybe the product owner is complaining about in terms of testing. 
that's the kind of thing that will help you to come up with those potential solutions too. But again, you're going to generate potential solutions. Do you keep hearing that theme? We always have, you're going to pick from a list of some things. And so that's, it's an important thing in this brainstorming, kind, I'm sorry, in the, in the whole problem resolution process improvement area is that you're always looking for potential candidates and you pick the best one from the potential set of candidates. Uh, because we're assuming that there's always more than one way to make a process better. And so you want to start with maybe the best way or the, it could be the cheapest way that gives you the largest amount of gain with the least amount of effort and time. All of those factors go into the decision. Okay, then you're going to try out the potential solutions and decide on one. And I'll give you an example. Uh, some years ago, quite a few, I started to do risk-based testing. Uh, and so the first customer that I tried it on, you know, I went in and I said, well, you know, I like to, we're going to do a risk-based testing approach on this project. Uh, and so I explained the whole idea to her and laid everything out. And we were in a meeting. And so I said, you know, if you could help me to understand what are the most important thing uh, that uh, you expect this product to do. And I said, and I'll come up and look at the risk associated with it, and that'll help us with the test strategy. And so she made a statement like this application, it was, um, they were going to be evaluating the app. The bomb detection people were going to use this app to help them defuse the bomb. And so she said, I want this application to be so intuitive that the bomb people would never need to go to help. And so I sort of sat back in the room and I looked around, I looked, the architect was in the room, the designer, and so I looked over at him and I, we'd seen the requirements, nowhere in the requirements did it say anything like that. And so I looked at her and I said, okay, I said, I'll come back to you with a strategy. So I came back with a test strategy and this is what I gave her. And you can talk about, you know, there's ways to get things sold. So I gave her a process and I said, well, you know, to get the bomb people to come in, I have to bring them in because there's nobody on my test team that knows how to <laughs> defuse a bomb. You know, we just don't know how to, so we can't tell whether or not the bomb people would need to go to help because we're going to need to go to help. And so we, we had the strategy, so the bomb people were going to come in. And because they were coming in, it greatly reduced the amount of time to test the other stuff. So this is what I told her, that this was risk priority number one. And I gave her a strategy that showed the amount of time and effort that we were going to expend on that. And then I said, then we had priority number two was some other functionality. It wasn't basic. And then number three was all business requirements. And that was my strategy. And so she looked at me and she said, you know, I'm not paying for you to test any, test, I'm not paying you to not test my software. And I said, I really understand that, I do. I said, however, I said, I can't sign my name to execute a strategy that I know that we can't get done in the time frame. I said, so we need to, to work this out. And so we worked it out and in the end, I didn't test this, but we wrote in that if time allowed, we would test those. And she signed the test strategy. So you can get people to do change things, but you have to approach them in a way that makes sense. Because in the end, I kept saying, I can test all of that. I'll test as long as you want. I just can't get it done in this time frame if you want this. But if you don't want this, then I can do that. So I just kept showing her options. And then in the end, she finally said, okay, you know, so this worked out. And you know, time didn't allow. There was no way we were going to get to all of this stuff, you know. So, but because this was a low risk, we really weren't at risk that the requirements in the application weren't done because they had a lot of processes in place. They had design reviews, they had all of these things. So there really wasn't, it was a waste to actually test every single business requirement because it was not necessary. There was no risk of failure there. And so in the end, I was able to convince us. So that's what you're looking at for a lot of these. And that, so you need information, you need data, you need strategy in order to get people to accept uh, and buy in. And what they tell us in terms of 
organizational change is that um, there are the early, just like with technology, they're the early adopters. You know, there's a group of you here that as soon as that new thing comes out, you know, you got it. And then, uh, and that's about 15%, the early adopters. And they're probably the early change people too. Then there's another percentage that come after the early adopters. And then the lump of people, that's the majority, is like third in line. And so understanding those kinds of things helps us uh, in terms of getting people to change. So when you talk about the new approach that you're going to do in testing, there's going to be a few people that go, oh, wow, you know, I'm really excited about that. But understand the rest of them are going to need to be what? Convinced. And so you have to come up with a strategy to convince them. And there's lots of stuff out there in terms of technique for that. How am I doing for time? I have about 20 minutes. Okay, all right, we're doing great. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, but that's what we, and so I, I won't talk in detail about it, but that is part of what you want to do in this solution. So anytime that you, you're gonna have the data to help you to back up why that's a problem. And so what I like to do with the data, for instance, like it's taking too long to test, you know, you need to be able to show how it's impacting what? Somebody's bottom line. So one of your customer groups, their, their value set of what's really important to them is being impacted by it's taking too long to test. I would suspect one of them is the project manager. And it could even be the, the customer or the product owner could be affected by that. And so what you want to do is then, you know, help up if you understand that they have a vested interest in this improvement, then you get what people on your side. And so that allows for you to begin to have what people that are willing to support you when you try to come in and do this new thing. Because in the end, this trying out the potential solutions, I mean, you can have the best thing in the world, but if nobody is going to allow you to implement it and they're not really going to do it anymore, then you really haven't succeeded in that. So that's part of the process that you're looking at. Okay, so how do you do, look for potential solutions for addressing waste? This one you're really going to love. The number one thing that's almost always a waste area is management activities. How many of you are managers? Quite not too many, okay. But it is, it is one of the, the biggest areas is management. And so what you want to do is that you want to then look at, you know, what are the things that we're doing in terms of managing that are necessary and critical and really affect what? Add value to your test organization's ability to provide that service. And then what are the management activities that you're doing that you're doing because every manager does it or, you know, that's how we've been doing it before. And so those are the ones that you want to cut out. But you do have to look and really say, you know, when we, when we do this particular step, you know, does it help the test organization provide better testing? And if the answer is no, then you want to consider, you know, well, you know, do we need it from an organization perspective or a contract perspective or what perspective? And if there's really no real justification for it, then you want to um, cut some of that out or reduce it. And that's where we get back to the lean principle. What was it? Empower the people. When people are empowered to get the job done and everybody understands what their job is and they're excited about doing it, then you don't need to have a lot of you know, management, making them do it because everybody understands this and it's working toward the common goal. The other one is reduction of authorizations and approval. Uh, in the lean concept and in Deming's world, almost all management approvals are unnecessary. And we all know that we need some. You know, my company has an interesting one for uh, expense reports. Uh, you can go on a business trip and they don't want to see any receipt unless it's over $100. And it makes it so quick to come back and do your expense report because the only thing you really have to show a receipt for is what, the hotel and the airfare because everything else is underneath that. And so they give you an allotment for, you know, how much you're supposed to be spending and they don't even care, they don't want to receive the receipts for meals and things like that. And so it makes it a, a very less painful process than you typically find in that kind of process. But so you want to look at, you know, are there authorizations and approvals that you have that again aren't adding value to the overall process and those you want to reduce or eliminate. Or and if you find that you have to do them, then you want to change when they're done. Uh, I was working with a group of lawyers, they were inspector generals and they were looking at a process and they would audit uh, these organizations. 
And the report took like two or three months to do. And then it took an additional six weeks to go through the approval chain. And so we said, you know, well, you know, what happens in the approval chain? Are, are you really making a difference? And that person was making a difference because she found technical errors, she found legal errors in the report. So then we helped them to structure a process where what? She got fitted in during it. So we built it in rather than the six weeks. So we were able to reduce the cycle time of that report getting out by like 40%. So that's what you're looking for, is that if the, if the authorizations and approval are necessary, then figure out a way to do them so that they're done in, in the most efficient way possible, and they do what? Add value to the process. But if it's a rubber stamp for a rubber stamp, then you have to ask yourself, do we really want to have it, okay? So then again, you're going to look at it, the wait times. This is a critical area for waste. Anything where you're waiting for something to come means just in time or fast delivery becomes problematic. So anything where you have wait time, can they be decided at the last minute and then we get to that core value in terms of lean. Then we look at when are the decisions made? Is this a tough decision? Is it an easy decision? When is it made? Can it be made later? So again, we want to decide as late as possible for some things because we want to give us time to have what? All the information you need to make an informed decision. So if you were to take a solution and let's say we came up with a solution that our solution over there to it takes too long to execute tests is that we need a better test environment or we need you know we need more tests so you would go through and then you would ask a lot of these questions about the solution and if the solution doesn't flush out if it's really not able to address a lot of these if you can't really talk about whether or not you know are the decisions that need to be made and are the, are the right people making it and is it really going to affect how fast we get test execution done, then maybe you've got the wrong solution. So it's a way to help you to come up with those right solutions. And remember we talked about the empowerment. Are there areas where team empowerment can actually uh, improve that process? So that again, you're not waiting for that decision to be made and that approval process to be happening later on in the process. So these are different ways to help you to find uh, the wasteful areas and potential um, solution areas when you're looking at the, the waste that you've identified in terms of your organization. All right, so once you've got your, um, you've identified the waste, you've identified your values, you've got your value stream map or your SWOT diagrams, you've got a list of potential uh, solutions and you said, okay, this is the solution that we want to try. Then you have to model it. So most of you probably heard is the as is process and the to be process. So this is the to be. What does the to be process look like? And you want that to be process to be uh, basic and um, easy to understand and hopefully uh, not too complicated in terms of being able to be understood. But when you're getting ready to write up what that new process looks like, you want to make sure that you propose what the potential improvement is supposed to look like. So what does the new state look like? What is the new defect management process? What does the new test management environment process look like? Uh, and then what are the processes or activities and controls and measures that are in place to make sure that it what? Works. So if you're going to try a new defect uh, tracking process, uh, then what are you going to collect to show whether or not it's actually working for you? And I'll give you an example. I'm working on a project now where we want to evaluate um, vendors' products and pre-certify them. And so uh, one of the things we came up with is what do we need to know about that vendor's product? And can we make sure that everyone that's evaluating the vendor's product is evaluating it the same way? And so we've got a series of processes in place and we are starting the pilot and then the whole purpose of the pilot is to do what? Test to see whether or not the solution we came up with for evaluating these vendors product and pre-certifying them actually works. Because we did what? We put together all our think tank people and we said, well, we think this will be cool and we can check this and we can check that. And so we, we I won't say we made up something, but. We, we, we designed a process, and now we have to see whether or not it works. So that's what we're looking for here. So you have, you document what the new state looks like. You look at what the measures and things that you're going to collect to see whether or not it's working or not. Then you need to have a roadmap to move you from where you are 
to where you want to be. And so maybe that involves training uh, certain people. Maybe you have a couple people try it first and report back to the team. Depending on how large scale the initiative is, you would have to have maybe a full-fledged plan or a little bit of a subset kind of plan. But the result of this future state is that you should be able to know whether or not that improvement idea that you're planning to implement can be accepted and improved for implementation, okay? And for some of you, small changes, I found that organizations can go in and do small changes without having a lot of uh, management buy-in, but large-scale improvements that require, especially resources, uh, in addition to the traditional resources, typically uh, require some kind of improvement. So you're going to need some kind of plan, usually, for that. Okay? So you recommend and implement the leaner solutions. So what can you do to prevent the existing problem from happening again? So oftentimes that means you're collecting measures to make sure that you don't slip back into the other, other problem. Uh, how will the proposed solution be implemented? You need to have an approach and a plan. Who's going to be responsible for getting it started and initiated and following through? What are the risks? There's always risk anytime you do something new like this. So what are the risks for uh, it, implementing it? And then again, look at that cause effect process. And what are the different changes you need to make in all the other systems like resources or materials uh, that also impact or other processes that have to change because this process is now changing. So again, if you think about that, this process is almost the same as the process that you would use to develop software. You know, you've got planning, you've got solution development, you've got design, you've got, you know, so it's a whole series of activities very similar to that. All right, so last, I'm actually there. Last item, let's see, can we come up with a solution? What would be some solutions to our potential problem here? This will be our last activity. So we talked about over here. Okay, so our problem was it takes too long to execute the test. And so we said these are potential problems. So let's pick one. Uh, let's say that we've got bad test data, okay? And we've decided that that's the root cause. Out of all the causes here, this is the one that is the root cause. So what's the solution to we've got bad test data? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one. So test data. Management solution. What else? What, what, are, what are other solutions to that? We've got bad test data, and that's what's taken our test execution process too long. Mm -hmm. Find the standard criteria for choosing the data. Mm -hmm. Find a way to use product, the sample production data. Okay. Okay, we're going to stop here. So we've got three potential solutions. So what will we do next? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we, we would drill down, and that's what she said. We would drill down. So we'd say, okay, what would it take to get a test data management solution in? So it might be we have to research tool. There's budget. You know, there could be approval. And so you go through, for each one of these solutions, you would come up with what, what would it take? What do we need to do in order to come up with it? And so then you take a look at the solutions, and then you're gonna, gonna look at, and you would probably prioritize, and based on your scenario, if you know you have absolutely no money for this, <laughs> you know, then that's gonna have to drop out. But that doesn't mean that you don't tell management that that would be the best solution because that could be part of the strategy that you can do these other things while they figure out how you can actually do this and in six months or a year from now, then that becomes the best solution that could be implemented. But that is what you're looking for here is you go through and you come up with what it takes and then you go through and do that improvement plan I talked about. What is it going to take? How will we implement it? Who needs to be trained? Who's going to be the lead, the key person? You always have to have that... Um, 
chair person that's the cheerleader that's actually going to get the improvement going but this is the process for pulling them all together so let's sort of summarize I see that Philip is standing up so I know I'm closing in on time so actually I'm at summary um, so we talked about then the lean process it's looking for waste adding value you want to look at your key stakeholders and think about how what each one of them values of the service that you're providing and that helps you to understand whether or not you're really giving them that value or not and that combination of waste and value is what you want to look at and evaluate your processes look at a value stream map look at um, do an analysis in terms of using the different lean techniques but you should come up with potential areas where you are concerned that we're not as efficient and effective as we would like to be once you have those proposed problems then you do problem solving analysis to come up with what your root cause or the major problem that's causing you to have this particular inefficiency or ineffectiveness and then you come up and with alternative solutions to address it and then you pick the best alternative solution documented as this is what we would like to look like when we're implementing this new process get it approved get it implemented and you evaluate and see whether or not the improvement actually what solves the problem that you identified back in the beginning when you were looking at waste in areas so that's the summary I do have a reference and in here are some pretty interesting articles uh, principles of lean software development so take a look at the references when you get the uh, the slide deck there's some really good reading in there uh, there's not a lot on the market out here now in terms of software testing and lean but there are starting to be uh, more people that are writing about this topic so uh, there's definitely tons of stuff on lean in manufacturing and there's more stuff coming out now in terms of services so there's lots of places that you can go to get more information and a little bit more training in it but I thank you so much you are a wonderful audience very interactive and I really appreciate it thank you <laughs>